Two times, uh, the one time I went to Marka and one time to Barawe. Both of these, one was on a school trip. So, so Bernadette Town, when you went there, like, what was your first impression? When you first, when we, so when you come into Barawe, as I re, and I remember seeing actually several things driving down the biggest camels I'd ever seen in my life, and these big, really healthy looking, well fed camels. And of course, they were wandering across the road. And then we came off the road, and you come down, you come down off the, I guess it's a plateau a little bit. And, uh, and then we walked down into the old town. And so here my son and I are walking down and at 16, he was almost my height. We got down below, Two little kids ran out and pointed at us and said, Wazungu Waili. And I knew right away, I thought, aha, he's speaking a Banadiri dialect because of clearly the Banadir and Barawe was a key, key place for Islamic scholarship in East Africa. All of these, and then, and then. ومرك خدمنا نبان يقيني فاصل بنادر لن ينسى محالي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to Benadi Fact Up A channel where we connect scholars, historians, professors and academics alike to the Benadi viewers watching all around the world giving us an opportunity to know more of their insights and research on our history Today we have Professor Edward Alpes as a guest on our show Professor Edward was a lecturer in the Somali National University in, 19, in the 1980s. Main research and writing focus on political economy of international trade in pre-colonial Eastern Africa, with special attention to the wider world of the Indian Ocean. So, Professor Edward, first of all, welcome to Benadir Factor, and thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today? Pretty well, thank you. That's great. All right, um, let's start off the first question. Just tell us briefly about yourself. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm uh, young. I was the youngest of three sons. Both my parents were physicians, uh, academic physicians. Um, and uh, I went to college. I uh, actually did my undergraduate uh, degree in in Africa in history and and wrote a thesis on on East Africa, actually on Uganda. And then I went to London to do my PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and from there, I went, taught for two years in Dar es Salaam before it was actually the University of Dar es Salaam when it was still part of the University of East Africa. And went, uh, and then subsequently, uh, right away, went to UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where I taught the rest of my career. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm married and have two grown children who are a lot older than you are, and uh, three grandsons, you know, and uh, basically now I'm uh, retired from teaching. I retired from teaching in 2013, uh, but I've been very active uh, and actually probably more active as an Indian Ocean uh, scholar than a straight up Africanist, though I still do a lot of work on Mozambique and and some on Tanzania. So I'm I'm sp- what really got you interested into taking a field in history or African history. You know, it's that's it's really interesting because I I I started out sort of just wandered as into pre-med because my parents were both doctors and one of my brothers actually is a very distinguished doctor and the oldest one also started pre-med and ended up in renaissance literature but uh it wasn't for me and uh in my junior year in college uh for the first time uh i was an undergraduate at harvard and for the first time harvard had somebody teaching african history and I just took his classes and it everything clicked. I took his classes and then other whatever else they offered, a class in economics, politics, anthropology, uh, and then wrote my did my junior uh, work with him and then wrote a thesis on that, which became the basis of my first article. And I think the reason I did it was two. Uh, I was in that first generation of white suburban kids who were really uh, – became seriously in, engaged by uh, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, early rock and roll, and black, basically black American culture. 
Uh, and the other thing was that in the same year that I that sort of I can remember 1954, I was 13 years old then. Also was Brown versus the Board of Education, which is the famous you know force causing desegregation that you could not have. There was no equal kind of education. And I think the so the combination of the political moment and the cultural moment and mm. and it and it's interesting. I mean, it was I think one thing it was easier for a place like Harvard to begin to offer African things than African American. I mean, it's quite possible as a number of my my age mates that some of them went into African American history. So, but Harvard didn't do that. They weren't. I think it was easier. You know, Africa was more exotic, a little more distant. Uh, but it was just what I needed, and it just turned me on intellectually. And and uh, and you know, then and then that's why I went to SOAS. Okay. And yeah, it shows, and then you excelled. I've noticed as well. You've um, you was a lecturer in Somalia. Tell us how. What's the story behind this? How did you end up being a lecturer? In okay. Well, well, that, that was a that was it was a Fulbright lectureship. So I was already, you know, uh, uh, was I ten? Yeah, I was already tenured at UCLA. UCLA had a uh, had already established a connection with the Somali National University at Mafole, the the English language one, which had been set up by, actually by Eastern Michigan University, uh, through a USAID arrangement in uh, after independence or at independence. And one of my colleagues, a very distinguished historical archaeologist named Merrick Poznanski, and Poznanski was actually, a, uh, he'd been in Uganda, he was married to a Ugandan woman, became the first professor of archaeology in at Legon in Ghana, and was very, and was a key uh, UNESCO figure. So he was, he had visited Somalia to, I guess, look at uh, various archaeological sites and things. And he made connection with with the university and some students. So, two Somali students uh, first came back. But in the meantime, I had become one of our students was uh, a very distinguished one of the most distinguished Somali historians, uh, Ali Abdul Rahman Hirsi, who had been uh, he'd actually done his undergraduate degree at uh, in the United States. So he had applied to the African history program, and I became his his mentor. And he did this rather famous, if you like, underground dissertation called the Arab Factor in Somali History, which basically argues that the you know not that there was not no Arab factor in, in Somali history, but that basically Somalis were Somalis, not Arabs. And this was at a time when Somalia had joined the Arab League, and all it still is, you know. And it's it should have been published right away because it's everybody cites it, but because of the but because of the politics uh, during the Syed Barre regime, he he never could do it. Nevertheless, he became dean of the college at La Folle. So before he left UCLA, when he was giving me a copy of his dissertation, handing it to me, he said, "You will come to Somalia someday." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> You know, because for me, it wasn't, I mean, I'd certainly never trained in Somali stuff, and I didn't speak uh, any Somali. And I hadn't really thought about Somali history. And what I did know, what one did know, was the kind of work that Ewan Lewis and uh, Bogomil uh, Zizaviki and people like that, which was all about Right. Pastoral Somali, yeah, and that's not what I was in. That's not what I did. I'm, I've done no work on pastoral Africa as such. I've taught about. It. So, uh, but when he did this, you know, it was a natural. I was going to be teaching when we we worked it out. I had I was half on local contract and half on on a Fulbright, which is the only way we could have afforded. I could have afforded to bring my family. Uh, How long were you? In Somalia. Oh, uh, nine months, ten months, basically an academic year, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but to study Mogadishu was interesting to me right away because I I, I was actually hired at Dar es Salaam originally to be their sort of coastal person, um, and I had been studying Swahili and I knew that literature. Uh, and so to come from Mozambique, which was where I'd done most of my work. 
and then to move up to the northern end of the of the uh, of coastal East Africa was really very exciting for me. And uh, so I taught uh, I taught a course on historiography. Well, that was the main thing I did uh, at La Folle. And uh, but then the other th and then I uh, through the academy uh, I found a couple of young Somalis who were my research assistants. And then we went around and we, you know, I conducted interviews and uh, and I taught taught myself because I had French and Portuguese already, so I taught myself Italian, which was easy to do from the from those two languages. So I was able to read the sources and I'd read some of it in preparation. I'd read some of it before I went. So it was really kind of a natural thing for me to sort of to to get. Uh, I don't know that to quite be quite frank. I don't know that I'd thought much about the Bonadir. But before that, I'd read people like Grotnelli too, who uh, Vinigi Grotnelli's stuff, uh, and had actually met him once. Uh, but working in Mogadishu, you know, one tends to, I, I don't ever remember looking north, historically speaking. I was always looking south from Mogadishu, mm -hmm. to Marka, Barawe, Zanzibar, <laughs> you know, no, and, uh, and so that's, that's how I got interested. Well, but it was Ali, Ali of the Rockman who, who got me there. So, yeah, that's very, I mean, you ended up doing some research there. So what are some of the researches or the work that you carried out? Well, the first thing I did, the mo there's there's basically four articles based that I wrote. Uh, and the first of them that was published in the Journal of African History, I in 1983, I think, is mo called Mogadishu in the 19th century. And basically, so most of my work was either 18th and 19th century. And so what I really wanted to do with that was to uh, not simply to do a town history. And I had also the work of uh, uh, already now the dissertation of uh, Lee Casanelli, who's an old friend, had had finished that. So I so there was the broader background to Southern Somalia was, you know, I had that. But I wanted, I was really interested in doing a town history of uh, uh, and I was in, I, you know, I'd done work on Mozambique Island. I'd done uh, separate, different kind of work on Kilwa, though I'd never done research directly in Kilwa. And so, you know, urban history was something I was interested in. And what I, and in the context of Somali studies, what was most interesting to me is that looking at the Somali, at Somali history as urban history was quite different from the general tendency to think of Somalis as being camel nomads who, you know, lifted up their tents and moved along and moved with the, with the seasons. Uh, and yet, of course, we all knew that Ibn Battuta had visited Mogadishu in the 14th century and that there was an ancient, really an old history here. So the so so I first did that piece. Uh, and that was interesting because it was, uh, nobody had really even thought to do this systematically. And so when I went around, when we went around doing interviews uh, in uh, in the in Mogadishu, discovering that it, it was divided into two, uh, that there were two halves of it, you know, and it was fun mapping it and sort of getting them and talking to old people who were always interested in talking about these things. So that was one piece. That was sort of the basic piece. Then I did a piece on on uh Futa, called Futa Banadir, uh, which is the, the cloth that was woven, the indigenous cloth that was woven. And that really was possible because there was a cooperative that the government had set up uh, uh, with uh, uh, international help. And it was not traditional. And it was, you know, it was in a go down and it was a cement floor. And so all the weavers were working in pits that were actually on us. The floors were cement. But it's an interesting style of weaving because you sit in the ground and then your feet are down below. You're doing in, in loom, a treadle loom, uh, and uh, and I was interested in African materials. I had uh, God knows how many uh, dashikis from Tanzania, <laughs> you know, all kinds of you know kitengi and uh, and uh, kan kangas, and so it was interesting to sort of deal with that and to get in the history. So I did a piece on that. And I was also interested, I'd also interested, and this really goes back to how I got interested in African Africa in the first place, through music. 
And so I have, there's another piece called uh, Dance and Society. And that also was a way for me to trace the Bantu elements among the uh, formerly enslaved peoples uh, like the Wazigua, uh, who were a Tanzanian people. Uh, and, and I'd already done research in that part of Tanzania, so I was familiar with, with that. Uh, and, you know, so these things just kind of flowed. So those are the four. four so three of them are, are really, you know, there's the Mogadishu, the two that are really more Banadir, well, you know, Mogadishu in a sense is is the main sense. More, more, yeah, it's more more than Banadir. But these other two things, and in the process, I came to realize that, of course, that the Banadir is different. There are all these, you know, fishing, for example, which I've never written about. I've actually have done some stuff on fishing in Mozambique, mm -hmm. but I know from the literature that, uh, and just the coast, I mean, every book, Swahili. Uh, Bonadir is all fished. I mean, fishing's a big thing, and the archaeological record shows it in early things. You find fish bones and stuff like this. So, yep. so you, um, to, to going back to Bonadir now, so you've visited Barawa and Marka, and then you stayed in Mogadishu. Are there what are some interesting stories you can share with us? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> There were two. I told I've told we we've talked about this. So in Mogadishu, the funny I used to eventually I, I got a, a car uh because the minister of education who was uh who was from the south, um uh, he would I would stand out on the main road out going out to La Fole at about midday because I was teaching in the afternoon. So I'd be it'd be quite hot. Uh and he he could see me. He said he could see me from his office in the Ministry of Education. And finally said, you know, we, we really you, we really need to get you a car. So I ended up buying. I I hated the car. It was a Fiat. I thought they were the worst cars in the world. But anyway, <laughs> but I used to ride the bus a lot, the little jitney buses. And somewhere along the line, uh, maybe Ali Abdurrahman had taught me that there were different ways to say stop. Yet there was a southern dialect way of saying it. And I knew that there are many dialects and like about 18 different dialects in Somali and a northern one. So typically I'd be the only gal riding in the bus, uh, which people thought was amusing in the first place, but they got to know. But then some, so normally when I'd say that I wanted to stop wherever I wanted to stop, I'd say Jochi. But other times I would try my best to get that guttural sound and say, Ailey, you know, people would laugh. And say, How do I? So that there were little things like that that sort of made you so. Uh, and Mogadishu was fairly big, but in a sense, the area that of downtown is a small area. So after a while, if you're a, if a, a, a Mzungu, a Gaul, asking questions about the past, people get to know you. It's interesting. They'll stop you and say, "Oh, you're you're interested in our history or something like." So, in terms of the two times, uh, one time I went to Marka and one time to Barawe. Both of these, one was on a school trip. So our daughter and son were both in the international school, and at the time, the internet, the the principal was Anita Suleiman, who was the wife of the vice minister of education. She was a British, she was Somali, and. So they had a, a school outing for our daughter's class. And she was, what was she at the time? She was in second or third grade. So we went down to Marka and I remember, <laughs> what, what do you remember about these? We So we camped on the beach at Marka. We walked around the ruins and things like that. We took the kids around and that was interesting for me because it looked, you know, the, the older bits and there wasn't much remaining, but the older bits looked like a you know a Somali a, a Swahili town, and uh, I just remember that there were a, a lot of flies on the beach, <laughs> and uh, and a lot of uh, jellyfish in the water because <laughs> a couple of the kids got stung, uh, and and that's really all I remember. But Bar Barawe was different. I went down there in uh, actually later in uh, nineteen eighty three when our son was traveling my son was traveling with me so he was 16 at the time 
And we went down. I wanted to do, I wanted just to see it because I knew Broadway had a lot of preserve, it had doorways and things. I took a lot of photographs of uh, doorways that looked like, you know, they were you know, Swahili doors, but they weren't, you know, they're Indian Ocean doors. Uh, and when we, so when you come into Broadway, as I re, and I remember seeing actually several things driving down the biggest camels I'd ever seen in my life. And these big, really healthy looking, well-fed camels. And of course, they were wandering across the road. And then we came off the road and you come down, you come down off the, I guess it's a plateau a little bit. You come down into a big flat. It was a big, just a big open parking lot, like, and with dukas around the edge. And, uh, and then we walked down into the old town. And so here my son and I are walking down. And at 16, he was almost my height. We got down below. Two little kids ran out and pointed at us and said, Wazungu Waili. And I knew right away, I thought, aha, he's speaking a Banadiri dialect because in, in standard Swahili, that would be Wazungu Waili. Mm-hmm. But in, in you know, in, in uh, Kibarawe, it was, it was different. Uh, and so I felt at home. So the rest of the, we went to, you know, we went to uh, a couple of the tanneries where because they because Barawi sandals are well known and walked around and took a lot of photographs and all the time I could speak standard Swahili to people and they all spoke uh, uh you know Kibarawe. So that was really interesting and and uh and I guess one other t- uh one other time we visited a uh one of the resettlement camps uh, this is sort of post that period's droughts. And there were resettlement camps. And they were interesting because, you know, there was all this stuff about how the Somali have a fish taboo. Yeah. And they yeah. could, and yet these are northerners who were settling in, in the Banadir and they were all learning to fish, you know, no problem. There really were no problems. They were actually, those, some of those resettlement places were quite successful in those days. So when you went, well, when you went to these towns, these old towns, I'm guessing you were anticipating a the Swahili architecture there. Was this still the culture and the was this still presence? Did you feel this? So when I did town when you went there, like what was your first impression when you first? Yeah, no, no, no. It was it was clear that one one was, you know, that one was walking in something that was clearly, in the broadest sense, Sawahil. You know, it may not have been Swahili in the modern sense. I mean, it's really interesting. I remember once talking to somebody, uh, an undergraduate at UCLA, who was in my class, uh, East Africa class, and came up after class, and I'd been lecturing about the Swahili, and Swahili, and she said, I just thought, you know, that was that was something in Mombasa. Yeah. She she had Kenyan friends, and she just thought, you know, and, and so, I mean, so there's that narrow sense, and uh, so I wasn't at all surprised to see it. But I was—I have to say—I was very pleased. I mean, I knew, you know, if you if you've read in advance, it's like reading a travel guide. It's reading. His, I knew that this was the way it would be. But the but the layout, to the extent, I mean, obviously, I was just there for an af- part of an afternoon. The layout of Barrow, it was clear. I mean, it was there. You know, the when you once you got down into the old town it looked like a swahili town it was just laid out that way uh so whether you called it so you know swahili or banadiri or somali it was clearly part of an east african post uh post yeah it looked i mean it looked like for example although it's it look, I mean, I said I'd been to Mozambique island and although there were portuguese buildings i think it's basically you know narrow streets some of the buildings are a little higher, you know. Was, uh, and even there's uh, there are some interesting descriptions from the 19th century by Charles Guillen, who was a French naval captain, uh, uh, who drew a lot. And, and I'd already, I mean, I already knew the uh, what Mogadishu looked like, and said so basically it was the same thing. I'd like to I like to call it Banadiri towns, Banadiri towns, because we eventually. Um, cultivated our own distinct sure. design. Um, I know it's a long time ago, but what do you remember 
What was your? Do you remember any encounters with Banadi people? I know you mentioned you met a Barawa man in Mogadishu once. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that was the only time that I really, in, in, uh, not in Mogadishu. I mean, in general, in Mogadishu, this was you know, and people. And in fact, most of my uh, friends, Somali friends, and the former students, the, the students we'd had, though they were from Mogadishu, they were in fact their families were all northerners, like Ali Abdurrahman's from from the north. He, he was from Gulf of Aden and that area, and and uh, they'd become you know because it was the capital, uh, they they'd become southerners in that sense. But there was a a, a, a very nice uh, Italian restaurant in. Uh, gosh, it was in one of the hotels, uh, not the Aruba, which was kind of a mess. Uh, we stayed in the Aruba, but uh, uh, the Shibele. It was in the Shibele Hotel, which was an old hotel near the, it was actually near the Casa d'Italia uh, in that part of town. And it had a nice courtyard. You could sit out in the courtyard and uh, eventually the waiter would come to you. Uh, and, and I remember somehow we got talking with a waiter i don't know whether he was speaking italian or english or what but i i and uh somehow i i must have asked him where he was if he was from mogadishu or something he said no he says i'm from the bonadir i said oh i said uh, how long has your family lived here he said oh seven generations <laughs> and and you know who knows if it was seven generations but the point was he was a well-established citizen of Mogadishu, but he still regarded himself as a Banadiri. And that, you know, that obviously, this story has stuck with me because he, because he was very proud of being a mm-hmm. Uh And I think, I mean, we didn't, you know, I didn't follow up because I wasn't, int- I, you know, I wasn't interested in the intricacies of contemporary ethnic identity within Somali society. But it was clear that he was both proud and felt it important to distinguish himself from the everybody you know everybody else who happened to live in in Mogadishu mm. and I'm right. sure that there were others like him uh, yeah they always went by no more no matter where they went they always referred back to their city where they come yeah. from. Yeah, no, that's 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 a that's a standard, that's a common kind of a thing to do, and so that was that was very interesting, uh, and uh, I mean the other thing that's really important, and, and I know I think you're you're you've uh, contacted, uh, have you contacted uh, Randy Powell's? Yeah, that's what yeah, I did. Yeah. I spoke to him. Yeah, good because because Powell's, who was my student and really a, a brilliant student and a, a really fine scholar, but his work. Uh, on on the kind of late medieval, early, 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 what do you want to call it? Early modern, uh, pre nineteenth century coast establishes how clearly the Banadir and Barawe was a key key place for Islamic scholarship in East Africa. All of these, and then and then of course that also connects then to the Yemen to the and to uh, the the uh, uh, you know all the the uh, the spreading of Shafi uh, uh, learning and and the other thing is that you also I mean, some of the, it's interesting in some of the work I'd done in Tanzania some of the people I interviewed in places like Sadani uh, and I can't I don't think in Bagamoyo but I know in Sadani at least one person I interviewed uh, his uh, his uh, nisba was Al Barawi. So there, are, you know, so it was clear that there was. That's another thing that shows the connection between the Benadir and uh, and the lo- and the longer, the more central southern Tanzanian coast. Uh, and you find people. I've never. It's interesting. I can't. You know, there's there are the the islands that are just on the Somali side of the Kenyan border, which have been tied up in all of the fighting and over the years of the ref. And I, then I, I've never had any interaction with that historically. Marka, which was obviously an, a significant town, but I can't remember anybody identifying with that as a nisba. I'm sure people would do it, but I just didn't do it. 
but clearly Barawe was was uh, an important place and people uh, who may or may not have been from scholarly families or something were nevertheless claiming that as their origin so I mean this is something that so today whenever I read history it just fascinates me how a small town like Barawa, Marka, were able to produce these big scholars and had this access to knowledge. And then if you search deeper, it, it comes to show that this is how influential the Indian Ocean was. I mean, for us to even have this connection, this trade. and this, Yeah, right. So in your opinion, how influential, how important was this Indian Ocean in terms of bringing... Well, this- I, well I think ta- towns like this were... I mean, they all had uh, continental connections, obviously. Uh, I mean, this is true everywhere, that marriage partners, trade relation, you know, getting food, uh, because towns typically have more people than they can produce, than they can feed from the town itself. So you, so there's that. Mm. Then there's Then there's the elite. And I think in all towns, one of the things that towns is there's a social distinction. Yeah. And I think that the the people who were most connected to the Indian Ocean, that those are the people who really got connected to the Indian Ocean. And I know you also you've done an interview with Anna Bang, and I'm sure she talked a little. She talked about this too with her her Camorian, and I mean all of these connections. I mean she's just brilliant on that. Uh, but I think that for them, both in terms of where you went to learn, and then and who you followed but also who you might marry eventually. And so these families became, uh, you know, elites married elites. They tend, they tried their best not to marry down. They tried to marry parallel, and if any, and if they could, marry up. Uh, and with everybody claiming descent from the prophet at some great distance, you know, there are all these, all these are really big factors. So I think one thing, one way of thinking of this and I'm just doing this on top of my head in a way, it's like when when people from the countryside, anywhere in Africa, go to the city, where do they stay? They stay with their brother or their cousin or their nephew or their aunt or something like that. They stay tend to stay with people from the old, from their hometown. So if you look at things like the composition of the police in a place like Kenya in the early colonial period, they're almost all combo. Because if you were a combo, you came to, well, I'll get you a job here. I'll get you a job. So the same thing I think works with within elites. Once a tradition, somebody becomes a scholar and prominent and also travels and then travel itself becomes important. And so these, these networks, being what you know in in a um, Nigerian context is called a bintu is a powerful element in the social composition of any of any people. Uh, in this context, you you know it's I think you wouldn't uh, you would it's a more dignified kind of a sense. But people the kind of connection to travel and learning and then trade because a lot of these people then trade and there's nothing mm-hmm. against it. Uh, but I think it's important to to realize that in the, in even as small a place as as Barawe, and I don't really know what the population might have been. I mean, but you know, let's just say five thousand, which seems reasonable to me. You know, it might have been a little might have been a little bigger sometimes. Well, the last statistical data that Italians carried out, I think, it was nineteen thirty to the fifties. It was around. 5,000. Okay, so that, you know, that's just, I'm just judging by looking at the place. That's not a big place. Mm-hmm. And yet, and yet it produced this long, this tradition of Islamic scholarship and of really important figures, uh, jurists in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it wouldn't have been everybody. Mm-hmm. They would have been, you know, they would have been the elite with it. It's just in the same way that, uh, uh, in Ian's descriptions uh, from the 1840s, late 1840s of Mogadishu, he says, well, you can see the, the multi-storied uh, buildings, but you could also see in the middle, you could see the Tukuls, you could see the, you know, the, the Somali huts. Yeah. So, 
you know, and eventually, eventually those give way to a more Swahili looking, you know, everybody's, everybody is building in, in mud and wattle, uh, and coral, uh, but, uh, but I, it, it, it's a reminder that there are that these towns, which are very cosmopolitan for some, are very local for others, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, one of the big questions that people have debated. And I just written a little something about this, uh, um, calling the Ismian Indian Ocean cosmopolitan. Certainly towns are by port towns by definition are cosmopolitan, but not everybody in a cosmopolitan town is behaving like a cosmopolitan person. <laughs> and I think that's really important to remember here. So I agree with you. Yeah. And this happens, for example, with everything that you mentioned, the, the, the networks that we created, but over time, due to circumstances, colonialism, things have changed. The system that we've created has slowly become to diminish. And it it, do you, um, it did have effect on culture, on tradition, on even on the people themselves, the cosmo cosmopolitan people. Now we're mm -hmm. changing our identities. And how detrimental do you think this is in terms of dynamics of the people in that social society? Well, look, I think it depends. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it's interesting that uh, just talking about the, uh, cosmopolitan, there's, there's a really, there's, uh, some really interesting work on on Swahili traders uh, by a German geographer, uh, and uh, she's done work that shows that when they when they go out to you know in places like Southeast Asia and things like that, even though you think of them as being cosmopolitan, they all hang out together. You know, they trade together, they speak Swahili together, and they obviously they interact with other people. You can think of a town in the medieval period like Malacca, where when the Portuguese get there, there's a description of Malacca by Duarte Barbosa, and he he uh not Barbosa, he, but anyway, he describes 88 different languages being spoken. So it was clearly cosmopolitan. On the other hand, probably almost all of those 88 people are, are hanging out in little neighborhoods together, you know. Yeah. And so 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 but in terms of how people I think it depends on how attached people become to sort of, we can't change the old ways, the old ways have to change. But the reality is in human society, things are changing all the time. People are readapting. They're adapting. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons why in all religions, for example, you have conflicts between so-called reformers or radical who want to go back, you know, and you can see this vividly in Islam today. Uh, most, you know, most of the people who, who are Muslims in, in the Western Indian Ocean are, if they're not Sufis today, their practices are deeply influenced by Sufism uh, and has been for a long time. And there's a lot of stuff that just kind of gets in and people do and they regard. And then you have other people who say, no, no, no. Hmm. Not even believe in the hadiths. It's got to be, you know. So you and you get this in Christianity. You get it in Judaism. You get it in all every, you know, all these. Every religion has got this kind of thing, and the same thing is, and that's just one aspect of culture. So, you know, you think about foods, for example, in the Indian Ocean. There's some interesting work on foods in the Indian Ocean and things that, uh, and language, things that become just normal. I mean, every day. I mean. What what did you what would you get in a in a Somali restaurant in Mogadishu in the 1980s? You get let's say you order goat and you get some rice and you get basta. Well, you know it's true that they probably there was probably some sweet rice things there. I have a tambi press from from uh, Tanzania that was, but pasta was not a traditional Somali food. But you ask any Somali today, practically, and they say, oh, yeah, pastas, you know, what we, you know, uh, and uh, things like that change them. They change eating habits. They change what people, how people think of themselves, you know, any, uh, I, I mean, it's clear that if people lose, uh, clearly the biggest thing is language. Yep. And I don't think, 
Somalis are in danger of losing their language. But there probably are some dialects that would go. I mean, it's cer certainly in, in Swahili, uh, uh, there are, example, and I don't know. Like with Barawa, after the resettlement camps in 74 to 80, and until today, where the population has changed a lot, and the Swahili speaking or the Chimini speaking, Barawa people have become all yeah. is a big threat to the language. But then it comes goes back to how attached you are you with your identity because language can link to identity. Yeah. One of the things I remember reading, uh, or maybe Tom Hinnebors told me this, that that Kiamu, the southern dialect, was being whittled away at because people were listening to Radio Kenya. So they were listening to standard Swahili. And that's what people were picking up. Uh, and uh, it was interesting. In, in, in the field work I did in Tanzania, all the interviews I did were in, were in Swahili. But some people, they would talk about things being in Kiluga. Luga is just tongue. It just means the, their mother tongue. But most people, women in the 70s still were, not as many were speaking Swahili, but everybody else's Swahili had be, basically was slowly overwhelming a lot of local languages. And of course, English, I mean, every, you know, this happens everywhere uh, with every language. Uh, so that's, that's one kind of a thing. And then, and, and, and it's, that's a different process from, let's say, what's happened, what happened to Aboriginal First Nations people in Canada, Native Americans in the United States, Aboriginals in Australia, where government took people and forbade, you know, took all these children away from their parents and forbade them to speak their own languages. So people, so you, you know, there's, I just read something, there was some, some Washington state uh, tribal group where there are two remaining speakers of the language. And that's sad, you know. Uh, I mean, it's at a certain level, it has no practical use today, but from a cultural point of view, in terms of how people identify, and given the fact that, that Native Americans have been about as screwed over as any people in the world have been, it's it's really sad. In, in Banadi right now, what we're facing is the erosion of these historical buildings because they're very close to the coast. That, that's right. The water hits the wave and hits the buildings. And also, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a thing where we're... Where, there's a lack of attention, there's negligence involved as well. When we don't value history, this is what happens. That's true. And it's also, and there's also, I mean, you know, given limited resources and corruption, <laughs> but even, even without corruption, you know, you could see it now, you could see it everywhere in the way in which, because uh, it's, the concern with history is part of the humanities in the broadest sense. So it's interesting what you're saying about uh, sea level, because uh, I remember one of the things that is has always been a feature, at least for a long time, of America is the lighthouse, the farol that's there. And uh, in fact, some of the some of the mosques along the Swahili coast are built right by the water's edge, yeah. and it's clear that the minaret. Which is, after all, not a is a unique. I mean, minarets don't exist everywhere, but they exist in certain parts of the Islamic world. That minarets were also markers, you know. Uh, and but losing the, losing uh, the shoreline. I mean, it depends where where you. In some cases, it's losing uh, mangrove areas, and in other areas like where you're talking about is actually losing coast. In archaeology, there's a fair amount of reclamation archaeology that goes on, but but it needs it needs, in the case of the Banadir, it needs a stable Somali government. Yeah. I mean peace, basically, you know. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. That that <laughs> is an element that contributes. Like for example, now if you look at Zanzibar, they had the Bay Bay to Ajaib, the house of wonders they used to call it. It, it, right. it collapsed, and the locals they raised they raised they, they raised awareness. Right, being in 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 this in this condition, and it resulted to the Omanis who were a former 
co- government there. Right. Need the funds to repair this. But now in Somalia, like in Shingani, a historical built, a historical town, we had a partial collapse of one of the lighthouses in Shingani district. But we just, it was just ignored and did nothing. Was not yeah. There's, a, there's this, my late colleague, he just died a month ago, Michael Pearson, uh, who is a real pioneer in Indian Ocean studies. And in his book on uh, on the Indian Ocean, one of the he introduces this borrows a term from geographers, where he talks about uh, looking at any site on the coast, the umland, the hinterland, and the foreland. So the umland is the area in the if you like the the neighborhood of of a town. That's the kind of area so where you have marriage partners and defense relationships and buy food from and stuff like that and trade with a little bit. And then your hinterland is for farther away. And and the other thing that is often forgotten in uh, studies of the coast is that people on the coast traded with each other up and down. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was obviously a lot of exchange between Barawe and Mogadishu, Barawe and Merka and down to Zanzibar, up and down the coast. So that so this kind of what's called cabotage, coastal trading is a big part of it. It's not that everybody is going overseas all the time, yeah. but they were, you know, but they were doing that. So I mean talking about the hinterland and the inland, as much as as much as we're so diverse, one thing you'll notice is there's a lot of cultural overlaps. As yeah. Well, which is very this which makes African history very fascinating and interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, you were, ta- you were talking about what do people retain? Uh, Non-Somali identity was reta- was re- uh, retained by people who were becoming Somali. Uh, and uh, I remember at one point there was actually a, uh, a fairly large settlement of so-called, you know, Somali Bantu in San Diego. And there was a big thing about, can we support them and, you know, and stuff like that. So, but, and the same thing would be true. I mean, because of, because of empire, because of racism, it's pretty hard for a Somali to pretend to be British or English. On the other hand, you know, I mean, you're you're always going to be. On the other hand, when does when does somebody? And I'm thinking of, for example, of the Somalis who were in Cardiff or Wales, where they're you know from 18th century. Some of them probably as sailors. You know, yeah. uh, when do they become Black British as opposed to being Somalis? You know. It's you know that's true for everybody. I think you know that are that are that are different. And so retaining you know retaining that is different, and and it's and I think it's particularly challenging in a context like yours, where it's not like the Bonadiris are in a foreign country, yeah, or, or in a foreign. But it's but this difference within sameness, you know, that's kind of tricky. I mean, there might be. Gen- ethnically different or genetically different culturally, but the fact that they've been there for we're uh, looking at thousands of years, yeah, much as the same as anyone that's living there. So, which is, but then it's complex because identity can change, social structures can evolve, and people, like right. I said, Somali can be in UK, but is it like British? <laughs> but I think for the big, the, the main thing. I mean, it would be. I mean, I think the the efforts to recapture history, to do what can be done to preserve things, is really important, and that can be done at a certain level with minimal funding. You know, you just have to tell people to protect things and maybe get the local government, the local town government, to do something. It doesn't take very much, and uh, and then just keep watching, and then, and then produce. The other thing is to produce easily understood materials that can be used by local school kids so mm. that they grow up knowing it. One of the things I found in this notebook, which is filled with, one of the things I did, I went to uh, the, uh, some, the the academy. One of my, tr- this is, oh, this is in 83. So it was 
So I went to meet with da- the folk dance and folklore team because I wanted to find out about dances for this piece I was working on. So I have little dance notate. Well, you can't see, but I have little dance notations of how people did this, and and then I went and then I went to the back and I have notes at a tombstone found near agricultural office at Barawe about 10 years ago or more. And the inscription was Abu Bakr Haji Salah, 710 AH. And then the tombstone, which had been seen by Neville Chittick and Steve Brand, archaeologist, the tombstone, one of my Somali things wrote down, you probably can't see it very well. Can, yeah, exactly. But it's, yeah, you can see, yeah, it's, uh, and I, you know, so there's a tombstone, which is, so the, I've got the Arabic here and, and somebody else's, but so things like that can be preserved. Uh, just, for, just for the context of the view, for the viewers. So that book you had there is your, it was your notebook in Somalia. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, talking about the what yeah. you know, preservation of history. I mean, this, this will be a concluding question now because it's been more than, more than one hour. Which, which was very fruitful, by the way. Um, in terms of preser- preserving, what, as a scholar yourself, an esteemed scholar, what would your advice be to Bernardi people in our context right now in terms of preserving our culture and identity? I, I think it would be great if you could produce some small, some small booklets. So you go and you interview your grandparents mm, yeah. and get the history of that family and then cyclostyle it or now it would be is easier because people do have computers and printers it wouldn't be hard to produce things that don't take much money and that you could staple together and distribute or minimally sell to local schools on in the bonadier uh write them and write them in you know off somali so kids could read them Uh, somebody could illustrate them with little, you know, not too fanciful illustrations. You know, so I'm sure you have artist friends in, in your crew. Uh, I think that'd be great to do. And it could be everything from family histories to somebody taking a building. What's the history of this? I mean, it's not some of it, you know, somebody have to do a little research, but then turning it into something in, in a lang- in a level of language that's not for an academic audience, but is popular. Yeah. And again, doesn't have to be very long and can give a few sources that people yeah. want for you. But the yeah. main thing is- I mean, this is the title itself is for the, the, for the general Bernardi people and what we're doing is connecting them to academics and scholars just to get a little insight of our history, a little taste. Um, another thing that we are actually currently doing, I didn't really mention it, we, me and my friends were create, we're, we're trying to publish a, photo book the pictorial history of Bernadir so this includes Bernadir people, um monuments mosques historical buildings the city the food a lot of cultural aspects and this would just be pictures and little captions beneath them them talking about them looking kind of going through like 19th century and 20th century accounts that have pictures yeah. that the Italian yeah. well, present. And have you been, uh, has anybody any doing this looking at uh, postcards that the Italians produced? Yeah, so Good. I've managed to buy a lot, buy a few from eBay, in fact. <laughs> right, yeah, that, yeah, the, uh, I mean, this is something the, uh, the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles has a huge collection, mostly French mm. and Belgian, but, you know, these p- colonial postcards, I mean, uh, you know, they were all post, but they're, uh, but they do show things. Uh, they do show interesting things, like clothing and uh, sometimes facial uh, scarifications. Tar- uh, it's it's photographs are interesting. I- you still have the photos of your collection in Mogadishu and Marawa, by any chance? I know it's been like. Oh right, yeah. You still have them. Yeah, I know. I have uh, some slides that I got from Merrick Poznanski, which actually show uh, weaving in Merka, somebody sitting in a village weaving. And so I'll, it'll take a while, but I'll get, I can get those yeah, to you. That's very historic. I mean, one thing, yeah. that, one thing that we discovered in our project was when talking to Bernadir elders is the photos that they collected during, during their youth. 
a lot of these people we didn't realize they were actually professionals that had jobs and they took for these these professional photos and it'd be very nice to show them to showcase them to the yeah. kind of other people to see where they came from and what we achieved but yeah yeah no absolutely going back to what uh, is there any current projects you're working on today i know you're retired so oh no i've been i'm hardly retired i mean i'm not teaching but i'm not uh no i do a lot of editing so i do i'm a i'm a senior editor on two different oxford research encyclopedias um and on editorial advisory boards for a bunch of things and i read journal articles and i keep on being asked to, to you know be an outside member of various dissertations and sometimes i do these but in my own work so right now I'm finishing, I've I've co-written uh, a teaching text. It's called A Primer for Teaching Indian Ocean World History with a historian at Ohio State University, uh, Thomas McDowell. Uh, I'm also have a long-term project on imperialism and abolition in late 19th century Mozambique with uh, Daniel Dominguez da Silva, who's a Brazilian. And in the meantime, just to show you that I'm, I'm finished, just finishing a long article on ivory and elephants in Mozambique. And this shows you how historians change. So I've written about ivory from the very beginning. I mean, that's what Ivory and Slaves, my first book, is about. And so I keep busy, you know. As I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a lot of things, but unfortunately, I'm not doing anything Somali these days uh, for Banadiri. But I, as you can tell, I'm still quite interested in it. And uh, I remember you sending me your bibliography. I mean, the amount of um, accomplishments and the books that you wrote. I think this is an, a, a further addition to all this. It's amazing and it's tremendous. Well, <laughs> it's what I like doing. <laughs> no, it's very, very um, inspiring. Well, Dr. Edward, it's been over an hour but Whoa. after i met i really enjoyed listening and just taking all this fruitful benefits I, I we thank you so much especially if, with everything that you're doing right now you still have you still made this time for us we we really appreciate your time well I, well i appreciate your asking me and we'll stay in touch and uh you know if if you get itchy at any point remind me about the slides and i i really will try and get those get that uh, no, material to you okay yeah all right all right then we'll um for the viewers for those who are watching I hope we hope you enjoyed any questions you're free to leave a comment and i'll pass it on to dr edwards and oh, we hope you subscribe and take care till then okay. bye uh, bye bye <laughs>